Welcome to Windy Night Stories. Tonight's story is by Mary Hartwell Catherwood, The Blue Man. The lake was like a meadow full of running streams. Far off, indeed, it seemed frozen, with countless wind paths traversing the ice. So level and motionless was the surface under a gray sky. But summer rioted in verdure over the cliffs to the very beaches. From the high greenery of the island could be heard the tink-tank of a bell where some cow sighed amid the delicious gloom. East of the giant stairway in a cove are two round rocks with young cedars springing from them. It is easy to scramble to the flat top of the first one and sit in open ambush undetected by passers. The world's majority is unobservant. Children with their nurses, lovers, bicyclists who have left their wheels behind, excursionists, fortunately headed towards the spot in their one available hour. An endless procession tramped by on the rough, wave-lapped margin, never wearing it smooth. Amused by the unconsciousness of the reviewed, I found myself unexpectedly classed with the world's majority. For on the east round rock, a few yards from my seat on the west round rock, behold a man had arranged himself, his back against the cedars, without attracting notice. While the gray weather lightened, and wine-red streaks on the lake began to alternate with translucent greens, I was watching the mauve plume spring from a distant steamer before her whistles could be heard. This nimble stranger must have found his own amusement in the blindness of people with eyes. He was not quite a stranger. I had seen him the day before, and he was the man to be remembered on account of a peculiar blueness of the skin, in which, perhaps, some drug or chemical had left an unearthly haze over the natural flush of blood. It might have appeared the effect of skylights and cliff shadows, if I had not seen the same blue face distinctly in Madame Clementine's house. He was standing in the middle of a room at the foot of the stairway as we passed his open door. So unusual a personality was not out of place in a transplanted Parisian tenement. Madame Clementine was a Parisian, and her house set around three sides of a quadrangle in which flowers overflowed their beds, was a bit of artisan Paris. The ground floor consisted of various levels joined by steps and wide jammed doors. The chambers, to which a box staircase led, wanted nothing except canopies over the beds. Always I give the conveniable beds, said Madame Clementine, in mixed French and English, as she poked her mattresses. De bon litz. Three dollar one chamber, $4 $4 one chamber, she suddenly spread her hands to include both, $7 de two ensemble. It was delightful to go with any friend who might be forced by crowded hotels to seek rooms in Madame Clementine's alley. The active, tiny French woman, who wore a black mob cap everywhere except a mass, had breached present prosperity through past tribulation. Many years before she had followed a runaway husband across the sea, As she stepped upon the dock almost destitute, the first person her eyes rested on was her husband standing well forward in the crowd with a ham under his arm which he was carrying home to his family. He saw Clementine and dropped the ham to run. The same hour he took his new wife and disappeared from the island. The doubly deserted French-speaking woman found employment and friends, and by her thrift was now in the way of piling up what she considered a fortune. The man on the rock near me was no doubt one of Madame Clementine's permanent lodgers. Tourists ranting over the island in a single day had not his repose. He met my discovering start with a dim smile and a bend of his head, which was bare. His features were large, and his mouth corners had the sweet, strong expression of a noble patience. What first impressed me seemed to be his blueness, and the blurredness of his eyes struggling to sight as Bartimus' eyes might have struggled the instant before the Lord touched them. Only Asiatics realize the power of odors. The sense of smell is lightly appreciated in the Western world. A fragrance might be compounded which would have absolute power over a human being. We get wafts of scent to which something in us irresistibly answers. A satisfying sweetness, fleeting as last year's wild flowers, filled the cove. I thought of dead Indian pipes, standing erect in pathetic dignity, the delicate scales on their stems unfurled, refusing to crumble and pass away, the ghosts of Indians. The blue man parted his large lips and moved them several instants. Then his voice followed, 
like the tardy note of a distant steamer that addresses the eye with its plume of steam before the whistle is heard. I felt a creepy thrill down my shoulders, that sound should break so slowly across the few yards separating us. Are you also waiting, madame? I felt compelled to answer him, as I would have answered no other person. Yes, but for one who never comes. If he had spoken in the pure French of the terrain country, which is said to be the best in France, free from Parisianisms, it would not have surprised me. But he spoke English, with the halting though clear enunciation of the Nova Scotian. You, you must have patience. I have, have seen you only seven summers on the island. You have seen me these seven years past, but I never met you before. His mouth labored voicelessly before he declared, I have been here thirty-five years. How could that be possible? And never a hint drifting through the hotel of any blue man. Yet the intimate life of old inhabitants is not paraded before the overrunning army of a season. I felt vaguely flattered that this exclusive resident had hitherto noticed me and condescended at last to reveal himself. The blue man had been here thirty-five years. He knew the childish joy of bruising the flesh of orange-colored toadstools and wading amid the long pine cones which strew the ground like fairy corn cobs. The white birches were dear to him, and he trembled with eagerness at the first pipe sign or the discovery of blue gentians where the eastern forest stoops to the strand. And he knew the echo, shaking like gigantic organ music, from one side of the world to the other. In solitary trysts with wilderness depths and caves which transient sightseers know nothing about, I had often pleased myself thinking that the Mishi Magdi Nago were somewhere around me. If twigs cracked or a sudden awe fell causelessly, I laughed. That family of Indian ghosts is near. I wish they would show themselves. For if they ever show themselves, they bring you the gift of prophecy. The Chippewas left tobacco and gunpowder about for them. My offering was to cover with moss the green papers, tins, and broken bottles, with which man who is vile defiles every prospect. Discovering such a queer islander as the blue man was almost equal to seeing the Mishi Mackinago. Voices approached, and I watched his eyes come into his face as he leaned forward. From a blur of lids, they turned to beautiful clear balls shot through with yearning. Around the jut of rock appeared a bicycle girl, a golf girl, and a youth in knickers having his stockings laid in correct folds below the knee. They passed without noticing us. To see his looks dim and his eagerness relax was too painful. I watched the water ridging up against the horizon like gold stone and changing swiftly to the blackest of greens. Distance folded into distance so that the remote drew near. He was certainly waiting for somebody, but it could not be that he had waited thirty-five years, thirty-five winters, whitening the ice-bound island, thirty-five summers, bringing all paradise except what he waited for. Just as I glanced at the blue man again, his lips began to move, and the peculiar tingle ran down my back, though I felt ashamed of it in his sweet presence. Madame, it will, it will comfort me if you permit me to talk to you. I shall be very glad, sir, to hear whatever you have to tell. I have, have waited here for thirty-five years, and in all that time I have not spoken to anyone. He said this quite candidly, closing his lips before his voice ceased to sound. The cedar sapling against which his head rested was not more real than the sincerity of that blue man's face. Some hermit soul, who had proved me by watching me seven years, was opening himself, and I felt the tears come into my eyes. "'Have you never heard of me, madame? You forget, sir, that I do not even know your name.' My name is probably forgotten on the island now. I stopped here between steamers during your American Civil War. A passing boat put in to leave a young girl who had cholera. I saw her hair floating out of the litter. Oh, I exclaimed, that is an island story. The blue man was actually presenting credentials when he spoke of the cholera story. She was taken care of on the island until she recovered, and she was the beautiful daughter of a wealthy southern family trying to get home from her convent in France but unable to run the blockade. The nun who brought her here died on shipboard before she landed at Montreal, and she hoped to get through the lines by venturing down the lakes. Yes, indeed. Madame Clementine has told me that story. 
He listened, turning his head attentively and keeping his eyes half closed, and again worked his lips. Yes, yes. You know where she was taken care of? It was Madame Clementine's. I myself took her there. And have you been there ever since? He passed over this trivial question, and when his voice arrived it gushed without a stammer. I had a month of happiness. I have had thirty-five years of waiting. When this island binds you to any one, you remain bound. Since that month with her, I can do nothing but wait until she comes. I lost her, I don't know how. We were in this cove together. She sat on this rock and waited while I went up to the cliff to gather ferns for her. When I returned, she was gone. I searched the island for her. It kept on smiling as if there never had been such a person. Something happened which I do not understand, for she did not want to leave me. She disappeared as if the earth had swallowed her. I felt a rill of cold run down my back like the jetting of the spring that had sprouted from its ferny tunnel farther eastward. Had he been thirty-five years on the island without ever hearing the old mission story about bones found in the cliff above us? Those who reached them by venturing down a pit as deep as a well, uncovered by winter storms, declared there were the remains of a woman's skeleton. I never saw the people who found them. It was an oft-repeated mission story which had come down to me. An Indian girl was missed from the mission school and never traced. It was believed she met her fate in this rock crevasse. The bones were blue, tinged by a clay in which they had lain. I tried to remember what became of the southern girl who was put ashore, her hair flying from a litter. Distinct as her tradition remained, it ended abruptly. Even Madame Clementine forgot when and how she left the island after she ceased to be an object of solicitude, for many comers and goers trample the memory as well as the island. Had his love followed him up the green tangled height and sunk so swiftly to her death that it was accomplished without noise or outcry? To this hour, only a few inhabitants locate this treacherous spot. He could not hide, even at Madame Clementine's, from all the talk of the community. This unreasonable tryst of thirty-five years raised for the first time doubts of his sanity. A woman might have kept such a tryst, but a man consoles himself. Passers had been less frequent than usual, but again there was the crunch of approaching feet. Again he leaned forward, and the sparks of his eyes enlarged and faded, as two fat women wobbled over the unsteady stones, exclaiming and balancing themselves, oblivious to the blue man and me. It is four o'clock, said one, pausing to look at her watch. The air gives one such an appetite, I shall never be able to wait for dinner. When the girls come in from golf at five, we will have some tea, said the other. Returning beach gatters passed us. Some of them noticed me with a start, but the blue man, wrapped in rigid privacy, his head sunk on his breast, still evaded curious eyes. I began to see that his clothes were by no means new, though they suited the wearer with a kind of masculine elegance. The blue man's head had so entirely dominated my attention that the cut of his coat and his pointed collar and neckerchief seemed to appear for the first time. He turned his head to me once more, but before our brief talk could be resumed, another woman came round the jut of the cliff, so light-footed that she did not make as much noise on the stones as the fat woman could still be heard making while they floundered eastward, their backs towards us. The blue man had impressed me as being of middle age, but I felt mistaken. He changed so completely. Springing from the rock like a boy, his eyes glorified, his lips quivering, he met with open arms the woman who had come round the jut of the giant stairway. At first glance I thought her a slim old woman with a kind of hair that looks either blonde or gray, but the maturity glided into sinuous girlishness, yielding to her lover, and her hair shook loose, floating over his shoulder. I dropped my eyes. I heard a pebble stir under their feet. The tinkle of water falling down its ferny tunnel could be guessed at, and the beauty of the world stabbed one with such keenness that the stab brought tears. We have all had our dreams of flying, of floating high or low, lying extended on the air at will. By what process of association I do not know, the perfect naturalness and satisfaction of flying recurred to me. I was cleansed of all doubt of ultimate good. The meeting of the blue man and the woman with the floating hair seemed to be what the island had waited for for thirty-five years. The miracle of impossible happiness had been worked for him. 
It confused me like a dazzle of fireworks. I turned my back and bowed my head, waiting for him to speak again or to leave me out as he saw fit. Extreme joy may be very silent in those who have waited long, for I did not hear a cry or a spoken word. Presently I dared to look, and was not surprised to find myself alone. The green-clothed amphitheater behind had many paths which would instantly hide climbers from view. The blue man and the woman with the floating hair knew these heights well. I thought of the pitfall, and sat watching with back-tilted head, if they stirred foliage near where that fatal trap was said to lurk. But the steep forest gave no sign or sound from its mossy depths. I sat still a long time in a trance of the senses, like that which follows a drama whose spell you would not break. Masts and cross-trees of ships were banded by ribbons of smoke blowing back from the steamers, which towed them in lines up or down the straits. Towards sunset, there was a faint blush above the steel-blue waters, which at their edge reflected the blush. Then mist closed in. The sky became ribbed with horizontal bars, so that the earth was pent like a heart within a hollow of some vast skeleton. I was about to climb down from my rock when two young men passed by, the first strollers I had noticed since the blue man's exit. They wrapped stones out of the way with their canes and pushed the caps back from their youthful faces, talking rapidly in excitement. When did it happen? About four o'clock. You were off at the golf links. Was she killed instantly? I think so. I think she never knew what hurt her after seeing the horses plunge and the carriage go over. I was walking my wheel downhill just behind, and I didn't hear her scream. The driver said he lost the brake, and he's a pretty spectacle now, for he landed on his head. It was that beautiful old lady with the flyaway hair, it was that beautiful old lady with the flyaway hair, that we saw arrive from this morning's boat while we were sitting out smoking, you remember. Not that one. That was the woman. Had a black maid with her. She's a southerner. I looked on the register. The other young fellow whistled. I'm glad I was at the links and didn't see it. She was a stunning woman. Dust stalked grimly down from eastern heights and blurred the water earlier than on rose-colored evenings, making the house-returning walker shiver through evergreen glooms along shore. Lights of the sleepy old mission had never seemed so pleasant, though the house was full of talk about that day's accident at the other side of the island. I slipped out before the early boat left next morning, driven by undefined anxieties toward Madame Clementine's alley. There is a childish credulity which clings to imaginative people through life. I had accepted the blue man and the woman with the floating hair in the way which they chose to present themselves, but I began to feel like one who sees a distinctly focused picture shimmering to a dissolving view. The intrusion of an accident to a stranger at another hotel continued this morning, for as I took the long way around the bay, before turning back to Clementine's Alley, I met the open island hearse, looking like a relic of provincial France, and in it was a coffin, and behind it moved a carriage in which a black maid sat weeping. Madame Clementine came out to her palings and picked some of her nasturtiums for me. In her mixed language she talked excitedly about the accident. Nothing equals the islander's zest for sensation after his winter trance when the summer world comes to him. When I heard it, I confessed, I thought of the friend of your blue gentleman. The description was so like her, but I saw her myself on the beach by the giant stairway after four o'clock yesterday. Madame Clementine contracted her short face in puzzled wrinkles. There is one gentleman of redhead, she responded, but none of blue, pasta too. You must know whom I mean, the lodger who has been with you thirty-five years. She looked at me as one who has either been tricked or is attempting trickery. I don't know his name, but you certainly understand. The man I saw in the room at the foot of the stairs when you were showing my friend and me the chambers, day before yesterday. There was nobody. The room at the foot of the stair is empty all season. To the suite I put in some young lady that arrived this night. Madame Clementine, I saw the man with the blue skin on the beach yesterday. I stopped. He had not told me he lodged with her. That was my own deduction. I saw him the day before in this house. Don't you know any such person? He has been on the island since that young lady was brought to your house with cholera so long ago. He brought her to you. A flicker of recollection appeared on Clementine's face. That man is gone, madame. 
It is so many years. And he was not blue at all. He was an English Jersey man of Halifax. Did you never hear of any blue man on the island, Clementine? I hear of blue bones found beyond Point de Mission, but that skeleton found in the hole near the giant stairway was a woman's skeleton. Milos, exclaimed Madame Clementine, miscalling her English as she always did in excitement. Me handle the big bones, moi meme. Milos that the doctor found him, say. I was told it was an Indian girl. You have here lies, madame. Milos there was a blue man found beyond Point de Mission. But who was it that I saw in your house? He is not in my house, declared Madame Clementine. No blue man is ever in my house. She crossed herself. There is a sensation like having a slide pulled from one's head. The shock passes in the fraction of a second. Sunshine and riding nasturtiums. The whole natural world, including Clementine's puzzled brown face, were no more distinct today than the blue man and the woman with floating hair had been yesterday. I had seen a man who shot down to instant death in the pit under the giant stairway thirty-five years ago. I had seen a woman who, perhaps, once thought herself intentionally and strangely deserted, seek and meet him after she had been killed at four o'clock. This experience, set down in my notebook and repeated to no one, remains associated with the old world scent of ginger, for I remember Clementine saying through a buzzing, You must have the hot wine and jaja. The end.